Grace and peace. God bless you. Welcome back to Soteria Prophetic Ministries. I'm your host, Elisa Fields. I'm so thankful that you have um, taken a moment out of your life, out of your schedule, to um, to turn aside just to hear what the Lord has given me to share with the body. I um, also want to take a few moments to um, really thank and appreciate our listeners, those of you who have subscribed, those of you who have shared. Um, our messages, we're receiving some um, very encouraging feedback. Um, people are asking questions and um, are just really being blessed and inspired by, um, you know, some of the things that we're sharing. So that's always our endeavors to be a blessing to people, right? You know, if we're blessed, the Bible says more blessed to, blessed to give than to receive. So um, I truly consider it a um, privilege to um, be able to come and share with you. So welcome and thank you. Today I'm talking about the art of mercy, the art of mercy. Um, you know, those of you who kind of been listening to me for a little bit, you know that I often rise early and um, just spend time in the presence of God and dwell on some things, maybe review some dreams that I've had, which I had a very lucid dream last night. I don't know what that means right now, but um, I'll certainly I'll certainly find out. Um, but at any rate, uh, just I was just meditating on some things that I had gone through um, in recent years past, and I thought about the mercy, the mercy of God, and also the mercy of people. And a scripture came to mind, of course, coming out of Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, where Jesus um, introduced uh, these eight characteristics of what a what a believer, what a follower or a disciple of Jesus Christ should uh, exemplify. Eight Christian, you know, eight traits, and um, I'm not going to go into all of them, but I wanted to pull out the trait of being merciful, and to hear what God says about that, what He thinks about that, what comes along with it, what are the advantages of being, excuse me, of being merciful, and what are the disadvantages of not being merciful so i'm gonna look at that for a little bit today matthew chapter 5 verse 7 this is jesus speaking blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy i mean that's like to the point right blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy so let me just give you an example give you a definition of what mercy means uh it's a greek word and i cannot pronounce it intelligently but i'll try um, it's um, alimonies, alimonies. It's the Greek word for merciful. Um, I'm sure I mispronounced it. And I do apologize. Uh, but it literally means to be full of pity, to be merciful, to be compassionate. And um, mercy is to to have compassion. The, the root, the I guess the foundation definition of merciful uh, or mercy rather is to have compassion, to have pity on your fellow man um now these are one of the eight traits of the beatitudes that jesus talked about um in matthew chapter five a very good study and i think sometimes you know we are such a people um who are diligent over pursuing spiritual gifts um you know for the charisma of it for the platform that it brings in some cases but i think it's also important to um look at what traits we should have as disciples, as those who represent Jesus Christ as ambassadors of the kingdom, do we have character traits that mirror that of the Lord Jesus Christ? And so being merciful is certainly one of them. Um, I wanted to bring that point out because, um, well, I'll just share what was on my heart that, you know, it's, it's something disturbing when someone whether you know them or not, is going through a season of life where there's, you know, adversity and challenges, and conflict and hardship or, you know, any of those negative types of experiences. And they're going through that, whether it's someone you know personally, whether it's someone, you know, that you don't know. And we catch ear of it, right? You, you just find out because, I mean, you know, talk talks. <laughs> and um, you find out about what so-and-so was going through and then there's a reaction that each of us have whether you're saved or unsaved at this point um there is a reaction that e just a human reaction that is going to uh be based upon i think the root of our being the core of our being um and so 
you know, when this, this, these, this negative news hits our ears, how do we respond? Out of which character trait do we, do we respond? Are we happy that somebody's going through or, you know, uh, uh, feeling some type of ill, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a word I want to use. It's not coming to me right now, but is this some kind of, um, you know, do we take delight, put it like that, in someone's pain or in someone's mishap or misfortune? Do we take, do we, do, you know, do we take pleasure? Do we derive pleasure out of someone else's pain? You know, you think about it. Think about when, when news has hit you uh, about someone else's situation, maybe their relationship, family, matters, job, or whatever, whatever that situation looks like for that person. And, you know, someone brings it to you. You stumble across it. You know, how, what is your initial reaction? Is it one that says, oh, my God, let us pray. You know, that must be awful for her. That must be awful for him. Uh, I can't imagine what they're going through. You know, and so is our reaction and a genuine, now we all talk about just being genuine and sincere. I'm not talking about the religious hypocritical thing, but it, is your reaction a genuine reaction of pity and compassion to where if it's in your power to help that person, is that something that you, that you are, uh, you know, that drives you? If someone comes to see you with something about someone and they're going through a hard time and you have it in your power to help them, do you do that? You know, are you driven by compassion or is it a reaction to where, well, that's what they get. They should have known better or, um, I'm glad somebody finally, whatever, or, um, you know, it is, you know, I could have seen it come, you know, some type of negative reaction. And we may not think of it in terms of, am I? you know, you know, guiding my life according to Matthew chapter five verse seven, when something happens, or do I just immediately react out of something, my own personal will toward that or ill will in some cases toward a person. So I think it really, it really, it really matters. It really matters when we say, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Christ. And, you know, I, I want to go to heaven and I want to do all of these things. But then, you know, what are some of the things that are really um, harboring in our hearts and I'm telling you, some of the things you want, the Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? You know, for God even tries the reins of the heart. So a lot of times we, I think most of us think that we're really good people. And I hope in, I hope in most cases that you're genuinely right, you know, about the assumption of yourself. But I think for the most part, we think that we're genuinely good people. But I think what really the litmus test of how genuinely good we are um, is when we're presented with a situation and it calls for a response. How do we respond? You know, the Bible talks about, maybe I can pull it up real quick, about the man who needed help. And he, one gentleman didn't want to um, give him bread or whatever. Let me see if I can find it really quick. Um, let's see. I don't know why I didn't have it in my notes. I just felt like I wanted to share that one. Um. Just a moment. This is in Luke chapter 11. Um, let's see, Luke chapter 11. Let's look at verse 5. It's the parable of the friend at midnight, all right? Um, let's see, just give me one second. I'm going to see if I can pull it up, the whole context. Here we go. Go. All right. This is Luke chapter 11, verse five. And again, we're just talking about the art of mercy. Um, and he said unto them, Luke chapter 11, verse five, which of you, which of you should have a friend and should go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed and I cannot rise up and give you this bread. And so the Bible says, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he's a friend excuse me, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he, as he needed, right? And so here's what he's talking about. Even though you don't want to do something, I think this <clears throat> also goes back to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, being compassionate. You know, Jesus healed because of his compassion. It's not that you want to do something all the time. I mean, let's just talk about the humanity of it. It's not that you want to do something all the time, but you're moved 
by compassion. And so, you know, this is what Jesus is saying here. You know, the man is saying, you know, I don't want to get out of my bed. You know, who wants to do that? You know, who gets a phone call from a friend or family member, somebody in distress, you know, at an awkward time, you know, whether you're busy or whether you're not busy, it's just your own personal time. And, and you're having to just abandon what your plans were to see about somebody else. Well, that speaks to the art of mercy. And then we look at it like this. You know, we're slow. Some of us, we're slow to move to help someone else. But when we're in our time of need, you know, we expect that same thing, right? Remember I talked about a few um, shows ago about uh, the law of reciprocity, sowing and reaping, right? Well, this kind of goes along those lines. When you are a compassionate person, when you have pity on people in your time of need, you know, even the Bible says, he that lends to the poor, the Lord will remember him in his time of need. And lending to the poor is not always giving money to a food bank or, you know, to a homeless shelter. It just means someone who is in a season of poverty, whatever that looks like. They may be in a season of hardship and you're in position to lend. You're in a position to be a blessing to that person. The Bible says the Lord will remember them in their time of need. And so this all goes back to, uh, 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 um, you know, developing a spirit of mercy, developing a spirit of compassion and being pitiful. I don't mean being pitiful, but, you know, showing pity. Let me correct that. Showing pity on mankind. All right. So I gave you Matthew 5, 7, and I kind of went over to Luke 11, 5 for a minute. But I want to show you something. Because um, I was talking about how, you know, these reactions that we have when we hear things that, um, you know, about people. And, you know, like I said, you want it. listen, I, I hear things. I don't go looking for news. But trust me, I'm not that one that just keeps my ear you know, to everybody's mouth, wanting to hear what's happening with so-and-so. I, you know, my, my hands are so full with different tasks that the Lord has uh, uh, placed upon me in my own personal life and my family and my career and my church. I'm just not that one that sits on the porch waiting for somebody to bring me some news. I, you know, I, I just, I thank God I'm just not that person. Um, but there are some people like that. They thrive on the downfall of others. And something is intrinsically wrong with a person that thrives that if you, it makes them feel good when somebody else, and that's kind of what I was talking to the Lord about in prayer this morning. I said, God, I said, how is it that people can, you know, call themselves believers and, you know, name the name of the Lord, right? But when when they hear bad news, it 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 encourages them, you know, in a weird way that they thrive off of hearing bad news. And so, you know, the Holy Spirit took me to Proverbs chapter six, and um. I'm going to read verses 16 through 19. Proverbs chapter 6, uh, verses 16 through 19. I'll let this plane go by. Have this way. Okay, Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19 says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Verse 17, a proud look, a lion tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Verse 18, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Listen, feet that be swift and running to mischief. In verse 19, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that sows discord among the brethren. Now, many of us have heard this passage of scripture throughout the course of our Christian journey, and I still don't believe we understand the significance uh, of what is being said here. The Bible said these are six things that the Lord hates. It's something God hates. You know? It is something that God hates. And seven are an abomination unto him. These are acts that we commit that causes God to hate the very thing that we do. Now, this is the God that we're calling on. This is the God that we claim to represent. This is the God that, you know, we want to save us and heal us and deliver us and do things in our family and do things in our money and do things in our body and do, you know, this is that God that we're calling on, but we are acting out in character traits and behaviors and conducts that are grossly offensive. Not something that God doesn't like, but something that God hates. Hate is a very strong word. In the Christian language, in the English language, it is a very strong word when God hates something. So for those of us who are participating in these types of things, you know, we are really sowing to the wind and we're going to reap a whirlwind. You know, we're sowing something. 
we're sowing some corrupt, we're sowing some very, very bad seed. And God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. So if we're sowing this type of thing, we're sowing a proud look. What, what is the consequence of, of operating in pride? A fall. God gives more grace to the humble. God uh, uh, rejects the pride, the proud, rejects the pride and gives more grace to the humble. Right? God hates the proud look. He despises pride. If pride goes before the fall. So we know that the consequence of operating in pride is, is, is humility. You know, is, is being humbled, is being brought down low. Then the Bible says a lying tongue. Well, we know God says a liar should not enter into the kingdom of heaven. God said, you know, God hates all lies because, you know, Jesus is, he embodies, he is the personification of truth. So if we are operating in lying spirits, we cannot, it's antichrist spirit. Pride is an antichrist spirit. And I think we wonder why, you know, I talk to a lot of Christian leaders. I've got a phone call. I need to make it a little bit. But we speak to a lot of Christian leaders and they all say the same thing. You know, there's a great falling away. There's an apostasy there. We don't see the hunger. We're not seeing, you know, the thirst. We're not seeing things for God because there's a great falling away. It's already been prophesied. It's not this, it, you know, I'm not saying that we should just accept it and just roll over. But what I'm saying is it's inevitable. It's inevitable. We're in those days where people are, uh Lovers of themselves, proud, boasters, heady, high-minded, you know, disobedient, unthankful, truth breakers, the whole, you know, come on, it's, it, we're in that dispensation and we've been in that dispensation for a long time and it's only going to intensify. So we have to, we have to prepare ourselves and not be drawn in, um, still operate in the art of mercy, the spirit of mercy, even, you know, when it's a situation, um, that you don't quite understand. We're not going to understand everything. You're not, you know, sometimes you don't, I was praying the last night about something and I said, God, I said, you know, um, I remember years ago, there were situations that I did not have an understanding of. I said, but now I understand why you did that. I understand why you shut that door. I understand why you said no. I understand why you blocked it, but it took years for me to acquire that understanding. So there will be things that God will require you to be merciful about without giving you the understanding why so you would just have to god will require you to act in mercy and the understanding will come later sometimes times the understanding will come years later so you know god's not he's not listen our obedience is not contingent upon whether we understand what god is doing or not because many times you won't understand it my thoughts are not like your thoughts he says neither are my ways and your ways you know it's the heavens are higher than, higher than the earth so are my ways and yours and my thoughts and yours so we're not going to understand everything we're not you know but that still does not um you know release us from the obligation of acting in mercy do it and, and let god give you the understanding later um so these are six things in proverbs 6 chapter 16 verse 19 that god hates and we see this operating in a lot of um, proclaiming believers, not pri- operating in pride. I'm better than you. Uh, you know, I, I, I have a bigger house than you. I have a nicer car than you. I wear finer clothes than you. I have a greater ministry than yours. I've got a better job. Pride, where you're looking down on someone. God hates pride. Okay, whatever you have, you have it by the mercy of God. And Job made it clear: the Lord gives and the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So bless God. Be humble about what God has blessed you with. You are blessed. But you're not blessed to consume it for yourself and hoard it for yourself. You're blessed to be a blessing to others. So God hates pride. He hates a liar. He said, a liar should not tarry in my sight. No liars will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Hands that shed innocent blood. You know how God feels about that. Jesus said, even if you, even if you call your brother a name in anger, you're in danger of the wrath of God. So imagine folks are cursing folks out. That's shedding blood. You're murdering their their personality. You're murdering their ego. You're murdering their esteem. You're murdering that person. Murder does, doesn't mean, mean that you take a knife or a gun or some other weapon and do bodily harm. But you can murder with your mouth. You can murder with your tongue. How many times have we gathered around dinner tables and, and, and you know, and murdered people, slaughtered people, ripped them to pieces? The Bible said, gnashed upon them with our teeth. That's a spirit of murder. God hates that. Um, the heart that divides the wicked imagination. In other words, the heart, like and I said earlier, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? You will never know. And, and trust me when I say this, I'm, I'm saying this with a, uh, from the bottom of my heart, of the heart that I know. And I say that because we don't know our heart. You know, I love you with my whole heart. You don't even know your whole heart. 
<laughs> you don't even know. Listen, we don't really know. And I found this out at the um, doctor's office yesterday. You don't even really know yourself. Because as you age, as we age, there's still uh, things about you that are developing. So you don't even really know your whole self yet. Circumstances will reveal uh, increments of who you are. If someone does something to you, you're going to know how much you love them with your whole heart. You know, if someone uh, 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 mistreats you, you're going to know how much you love them with your whole heart. So, you know, it's so easy to say something. It's so easy to to claim something. But, you know, when the rubber hits the road, wh where is that? I thought you said you love me with your whole heart. What happened? So that's why we need a God kind of love, because that's unconditional. Um, we had the filet of the brotherly love. I love you long as things are going right, you know. <laughs> praise God so um a heart that divides wicked imagination still talking about the art of mercy but I wanted to break this down for those of you that may not even never thought about it like this and I just want to just you know give you understanding um but the heart that's you're always meditating on somebody's downfall how you can overcome how you can get them back how you can retaliate how you can you know you know just it's always evil I mean, this is what caused the earth to be flooded in the first place. The Bible said the, in, the imaginations of, the, of man's heart were wicked continually. That means every thought that man had, except for Noah and his family, well, except for Noah, okay? His family was saved by Noah's grace, but, or by the grace of God through Noah's lifestyle. But the Bible said the hearts of, uh, thoughts of man, the hearts were wicked continually. That means when you wake up, you're thinking wicked. When you go through your day, you're thinking wicked. When you lay down, you think, it's continually. Can you imagine how that grieves God? To bless him with one side of our mouth and tear somebody else down with the other side of our mouth. And I'll tell you this too. I was coming back. I was dropping my son off the um, uh, campus this morning. And, um, you know, the Lord was just building this message in my, the case. I like to say I'm presenting this case. Um, because we must be able to defend the gospel. And, and so the Lord was kind of building this case in my spirit, right? And so I saw, what did I see, Father? It was a, um, it was a young man. A young woman i can't remember now somebody i saw this morning on my way back home <clears throat> and um and i looked at them and i was like you know just kind of you know you look at people and, and just kind of form your own opinion we all do it and immediately in my thoughts because i was looking at that person for what i saw and the lord spoke to me and he said those are one of my children and they're bound by drugs and it let me tell you something i feel the presence of god hallelujah 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 this is why we must learn how to operate in the art of mercy because it's easy to say well i don't have a drug addiction in, in, in coursework we call it substance use problem or addiction it's not you know drug addiction or substance you know political language always changing you know i don't have a substance use addiction or problem um I, you know i don't i'm not homeless i'm not you know what i'm saying whatever you're not by the grace of god but then does that really make you better than your fellow man? Because there were some things that God delivered us from too. And I'll be the first one to raise both hands and my feet and say, God delivered me. And there were things that I did that the Bible says it's, it's even a shame to speak of those things. God, I feel the presence of God. Hallelujah. I feel a weeping, interceding spirit. I feel a weeping, interceding spirit. Glory to God. Glory to God. And so the Lord wants us to look at one another through the eyes of mercy. Wow, I hear you, Father. I hear you. I hear you, Father. Hallelujah. He wants us to look at others through the eyes of mercy and not through eyes of condemnation or pride or as is mentioned in the book of Proverbs. God wants us to be compassionate. Now, compassion doesn't mean you're going to agree with a person's lifestyle. It doesn't mean that you're going to license, you know, their sin or, or their behavior. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is just interceding. It's interceding. And, um, you know, having compassion on someone, it doesn't mean that, you know, you just give them a free-for-all. It doesn't mean that. But what it means is, like the man showed us, like the Bible uh, the, shown in Luke chapter 11, if I can help you, if it's in my power to help you, whether I want to do it or not, whether I believe what you said or not, whether, you know, you know, whether it's convenient for me or not, if it's in my power to help you, then I'm operating in the laws that govern Christian character. I'm operating in the Beatitudes. I'm operating in those seven character traits 
of a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then listen, the Bible said, blessed are the merciful. So it's not so much, because remember, God is all about transactions. Glory to God. He's always about, he's always about sowing and reaping. I, I, I've said that. And, you know, people hear succeed and they automatically think money because I'll just tell you, a lot of folk are in debt. You know, they made some very poor financial decisions. And then as I was doing some reading yesterday, there are a lot of people, even in the body of Christ, who are operating in greed. You know, they want, they want, they want the bigger, the better, the shiner, the better, the more, you know, they want, they want, they want. And they have no concern for their fellow man. You know, there have been times when people have sown seen into my life. And, and I mean, you know, a significant a monetary seed. And I turn right around and, and, and give it right back out. Because it's not just for me to hoard. It's not just for me. Glory to God, I feel you, Jesus. It's not just for me to buy a new outfit or to get my hair on my nail. It's not just for me. I'm not saying that we're not worthy. You know what I'm saying? Of You know, yes, the workman is labor of his high and you don't muzzle the ox that you out of the corner. Yes, yes. Those who labor at the altar should eat of the altar. Yes. If you if be uh, receive of my spiritual things, I should reap of your physical things. Yes, the Bible says that. But also, there comes a time when you, the recipient, you know, there may be other places that God wants that thing to go. It may not necessarily be earmarked for you. It You may be a, a uh, uh, what's the word, a conduit. You may be a connector. To, it comes to you and then you release it to some you may be an exchanger so everything is not just to come to you and stop there some things come to you and you pass it on like the knowledge of god the wisdom of god the understanding of god's word is not the bible said knowledge puffs up so, excuse me so it's not enough for you to just hear it and just oh you live the blessed life and oh you understand scripture and, oh you apply but are you helping somebody else get to that place of understanding that you've arrived at do you see what i'm saying so um god wants us to operate in mercy and when i saw that young uh, man this morning he said you know i just kind of looked at him and i had my own thought like wow this is a a, a drug addict or you know I mean? I, I, i'm saying what i saw i'm not judging but i'm saying what i saw and the lord said it's like he just he, he superimposed his voice you know over my thoughts and he said that's one of my children that's bound on drugs they're bound up a drug spirit a cocaine spirit has my son, has my daughter. That's how God sees us when we're bound. You know, like the woman, the woman from Samaria came to Jesus and should help my daughter. She, she's, she's vexed. She's destroying herself. And that's how God saw that man. He said, that's my son. A drug demon has him. He's bound by drugs. But that's my child. You know? And it's so easy to look at people and see the thing that they're operating in and, and crucify the person and not look at the demon that's behind their behavior and conduct. Again, not licensing nothing because, you know, they're going to operate in that spirit until they're set free. And unfortunately, some are going to carry that straight to their graves. Those demons will walk them to their grave. But it doesn't change how God feels about them. He said, I love them. That's my son. That's my daughter. You and I, those of you that have children, you know, our children do some, they do some weird things sometimes, you know, they do some really weird things sometimes, but that's still your child. You know, that's, wow, that's my son. He's acting up today. That's my daughter. She's acting up, but that's my son. That's my daughter. And you, regardless to how you feel, you still want other people to have compassion. That's how God felt about Israel. God, listen, you know, God went, he, he took them down through, you talking about going to the shed, you know? God spanked Israel like, I, you, you don't even want those problems. God got a hold to them. But he, and even he would turn them over to the Midianites. He turned them over to whoever, you know, whoever, Bab, uh, to, to the Babylonians. He'll turn them over to the Philistines and put them in and allow, allow them to go through bondage. And then he'll turn around, deliver them and fight against the ones who bound them up. That's God. You know, I can chastise them, but don't you touch them. You know, that's just God. So glory to God. I don't want to get too far away from where I am, but um Oh, hallelujah. So the heart that divides wicked imaginations, feet that are swift, and that's kind of what I'm talking about here when I said, you know, how how do you react when news is brought to you of someone's downfall or their demise or their, you know, some type of uh, you know, uh, uh hurtful thing is happening in their life? How do you respond? Are you that man in Proverbs six 
chapter, chapter of chapter, uh, Proverbs 6, 18 with swift feet. Not feet to help now. Because the man in Luke 11, his feet were slow, but he helped. Some people have slow feet. Pray over your feet. Father in Jesus' name, give me swift feet to help. Deliver me from slow feet. Okay? Um, Bible has a lot to say about feet. But, you know, in Luke eleven five, the man's feet were slow, but he helped. But in Proverbs 6, uh, 18, this man's feet were swift, but it was not to help. It was to hurt. And God said, I hate that. I hate when people are always running with somebody's news, running with somebody's downfall, running, run, 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 run to tell it. There's a, a cliche that says, um, a lie can make it a half, let me see, a lie can make it around, I don't know, town or the world or whatever, while the truth is still putting shoes on. And, and that's true. People are slow to tell the truth about something. But a lie, something discouraging, something damning, they're quick to run to tell it. And the Bible, God said, I hate it. I hate that. So just think about if you're that one, God, I need you to bless me. God, I need you to make a way for me. I need you to restore this relationship. I need you to break through in my child's life. I need you to break through my life. But yet, this is the op- uh, behavior that you're operating in. And again, I often say, you know, we blame devils. Oh, the devil's he's hindering me. and he's But it's not the devil. He didn't do this one. These are all works of the flesh. And then verse 19, false witness that speaks lies, a gospel, a um, tale bearer which we'll see a lot of that as times wind up. You're going to see a whole lot of tailbearing. People are going to, listen, if you have thin skin, hun, uh, I don't say honey, I don't want to um, be common with you, but my friends, um, get ready. People will lie on you. They lied on Jesus. They are still lying on Jesus. And if you're that one that has have thin skin and you run every time somebody, you know, come against you, I, I pray you'll strengthen the Lord. I pray you'll strengthen the Lord because people will lie on you and think they're doing God a, a, a service. You know? They will imprison you in a lie and think they're doing God a service. God told me. I, the Lord showed me. And God ain't with no, male, no more around than a man in the moon. It was their God. Their idol of a God. Their picture of a God. The form of God. And then, of course, he that sows discord among brethren. God hates that when you, you, you know, there are things each of us know about other people. And if you were to tell it, it would destroy some relationships. It would destroy some marriages. It would destroy. But is that your place to run and tell it? There are some things you just have to keep in the integrity of your heart. The Bible says many. you, you find many examples where so-and-so pondered it in her heart. Pondered. You keep it to yourself. Just because you know it doesn't mean you tell it. So there's an integrity that we must operate in. You don't tell everything you know. Even if you're no longer in relationship with that person, you're still bound by the laws of integrity. And you'd be amazed. People that fall out with you will run and tell everything and, and then got hands lifted up, want prayer and want Jesus to fix it. Take the wheel, Jesus. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Praise God. So I'm coming out of that one. I want to give you another example of scripture in Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. This is what the Bible says now. And he said, I will make all my goodness. This is God speaking to Moses. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So do you know when we pray, and one of the the roots, foundations of my grandfather's prayer was, have mercy, O Lord. In every prayer as a little girl, I would remember him saying, he would always ask God for mercy. He would, and far as I know, my grandfather was a merciful man. Um, But in his prayers, he would always Ask God for mercy. So in order to receive the mercy of God, then we must subscribe to the laws that govern the operation of the mercy of God. And that's what Jesus was speaking about in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the merciful. In other words, if you are a merciful person, if you are a person full of compassion, full of pity on mankind, full of a heart to help, the Bible says, in one translation, is happy are you. In other words, this is what qualifies you for a blessing. You hear people say, you know, I need a blessing. I need a blessing. Well, you know, there are blessings that are attracted to your life. Psalm, I mean, Matthew 5 tells you how to live a blessed life. It tells you. It tells you how to live. a. It tells you the qualities of a blessed man. Psalms 1 tells you the qualities of a blessed man. So it's not hard to figure out how to be blessed. It's laid out for us, black and white, plain. You can't miss it. 
But in terms of being merciful, when you see, come across someone in need, some, someone who's going through a hard season, going through some, you know, trials and tribulations, then we are required to show mercy. In the book of Job, when Job was going through tremendous trials and tribulations and his friends came around and, and, you know, they all, instead of trying to just be a support, Hey, Job, I don't know what's going on, man. I don't understand it. Far as I know, you were upright. You kept your family in order. You were praying, man, but something has hit your life, you know, and I'm here. I don't understand it, but I just want you to, I'm here. If you need me to bring you some water, if you just need me to wash your feet, if you need me to fan the flies away from your putrefying wounds, I'll do that. I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to, you don't even have to explain. I've had, when I was going through a certain season in my life, I had uh, one, one individual, I'll never forget. She came to me and she said, she said, woman of God, I don't know what's going on and I don't want to know. All I want to know is what do you need me to do? Do you see what I'm saying? She said, I don't know what's going on. I don't want to know. She said, yeah, I heard. I don't want to know what's going on. I don't need to know what's going on. All I want to know is what do you need from me? And when I shared with her what my need was for that moment, she was she she operated in the spirit of a friend. And that's what Luke 11, 5 is. I don't know what her situation looked like. All I know is she came through for me. I don't know what she had to do to do what she did for me. You know? Because when anybody helps you in whatever area of help that is, it is a sacrifice. Whether it's taking time out of their life, time off their job, time away from family, money out of their account, gas in their car, food off their table, whatever act of, of help, ministry of help, that they are providing or are or, or serving you with, it comes with a sacrifice. And, and so that's why the Bible says these people are the blessed ones. When you can see someone in need, when you can see someone uh, experiencing some type of hardship and it's in your power to help them, help them. You don't have to know all the, I had this one young man, I was at the YMCA a couple of, last week, probably Thursday, Friday last week. And um, this young man, he's a, uh, he's of West African descent. I could just tell by his dialect. And um, he had a little backpack on him, and I could just discern. I mean, you know, there's some people that just, you know, begging for the wrong reason. But I, I could discern his spirit. He was genuinely hungry, and he walked over to me and he said, "Mama," he said, "I'm he said, I'm so hungry." He said, "I went into the Y, and they only gave me uh, some chips and some juice. I guess that's what they had for." reception or whatever he said they gave me a couple of bags of chips and some juice he said mama he said i haven't eaten he said i'm so hungry he said do you have anything mama and i went inside my wallet and i gave him twenty dollars and i'm just i'm not boasting i make my boasting boasting the lord thank god i had twenty dollars to give him because i don't always have that okay um i don't really carry cash like that um but i had it to give and i took it out and my daughter because we were about to get out we had just parked and he walked up to the car and so my teenage daughter, um, she kind of looked at me like, you know, wow. You know what I'm saying? And so even in that, I sold a seed of mercy into her because she's going to come across a season in life where somebody's going to approach her and she'll be able to fall back on what she saw her mother do. You know what I'm saying? As opposed to you get out of here, you blank, blank, so and so and so and so and so. Don't you come near my car. You, now, you know, that's a seed too. Because a lot of times our children are... Uh, manifesting fruit or uh, yielding fruit that we've sown. I don't know why that child act like that. I don't know why they won't do that. Well, go back a couple of years and look at some things that you look at some examples that you've given them because children don't learn so much about what you tell them as much as what you show them. So sometimes this is not always the case. Sometimes we see things manifesting in our children. I'm the Holy Spirit to take me there. We see things manifesting in our children. And, you know, just because we no longer do that, you know, we're, we, we've been delivered from that. We don't, we don't do that no more, but you used to, <laughs> you know, you used to do that and you did that in the presence of your children. And so now they're acting out that see, it's just see, it's just see the law of reciprocity. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, even though, well, I did it before I got Christ, before I got saved, you still sowed it. Bad seed don't disappear once you get saved. You know what I'm saying? Or a seed that you didn't mean to sow doesn't disappear the minute you get saved. You think about the life of Paul. 
And Paul, you know, was, was a chief among sinners. And when he got saved, what did the Lord tell him? Um, what did the Lord tell him? He said, I'm going to show you many things that you will suffer for my name's sake. He was given thorns. He was beaten. And I, I know this is unpopular because I, I know some of you are like, oh, my God. I thought that was up under the blood. Yeah, the sin is forgiven. But there's still the fruit of the act that, you know, has gone into the earth. It's, it's in the earth. And so what we do is have mercy, God. Father, before I got saved, I broke up people's marriages. I was a drunkard. I was an addict. I stole. I Whatever. Father, have mercy, God. Take this cup from me. Don't let me drink this bitter cup. Don't let my children drink this bitter cup. Father, kill the seed. Kill every corrupt seed that I placed in the ground. Every every deed that I've done that brought hardship or conflict or challenge in somebody's life. God, I repent and I call that wicked seed back down and I command it to rot in the ground. You see what I'm saying? It's not that, and I, I think this is just, this bewilders people. Well, I'm saved now. Uh, you know, that's under the blood. Yeah, the sin is forgiven. But you know, you know it, it brought forth something. When sin is finished, it brings forth death. So there is there there has been an act that was legislated. That's why what Adam did when he ate of the fruit, there was an act. Because you can say, well, Jesus came. We don't have to die no more. Men don't have to work. Women don't have to submit. Yes, you do. We just, we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. We have eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. But we still have to go to work. Men still have to care for their families. Women still have to submit. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> Praise God. I don't know who needed to hear that, but there you, you know. And, and so let me finish this thought because I'm not going to leave you with condemnation. I, I, you know, I'm not, that, I will never do that. So what I'm saying is, if you see some things operating in your children that you know was some, a part of your former life, then you go to God in prayer and you deal with the seed of your, of your deed. Deal with it. Love that child, but you got to take responsibility for some of that. You see what I'm saying? I, I had one somebody, I was teaching this one time, the concept of, you know, reciprocity and seed and all this stuff. And somebody was like, well, you know, I don't understand. I, you know, God forgave me. And he said, you know, I'll cast your sins into the sea of forgiveness. Remember number one. And, and I said, that's absolutely right. I said, but how many people do you know had children out of wedlock or had children before they were saved? Right. And when they got saved, the kids just poof and disappeared. And, you know, everybody kind of chuckled and laughed like, okay, okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's a parable. Now you understand. If you had a child out of wedlock before you got saved, all right, um, and you got saved, and, and I, God forbid, I'm not saying that was a bad seed, but I'm saying it was, a out, it was outside of covenant. But now that you're in covenant, so what, does God just kill everything you did before you got saved? No, your child is still looking at you in your face, looking just like you and their father and or their mother, you know. Still got the eyebrows and eyelashes and the attitude. They still, they, 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 they still your seed, you know. So God doesn't. When you when you get saved, that's why salvation is a process. Oh, this is so deep. I didn't, y'all, I didn't mean to keep you this long today. Um, but salvation is a process. Once you give your life to Jesus Christ, Lord, I repent of my sin. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe you came, died, and that you rose again. I believe that you sit at the right hand of the Father. You know, I come into my life. Be Lord of my life. You know, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, 10. I confess in my mouth the Lord Jesus. I, you know, I confess I'm a sin. I confess that you are Lord of my life. I believe in my heart. And, and once you go through that, that's the first step. You know, then there's baptism by water where you, 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 in, in, you uh, participate in the uh, symbolic death where you come up out of the water. You hear people say watery grave. You come out of your watery grave. You're a new person. All things for, all things fast. We can hold all things for new in you. Then you seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit because you receive the measure of it at salvation. The measure of it is for the Holy Spirit to minister to you, talk to you, teach you, help you, give you understanding. But then you press further and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not the measure of it, but the fullness of the Spirit so you can be a witness to other people. So Christ can work through you, not just to you, but he can minister through you to others. It's a process. Then you grow, right? Then you deal with things. You identify things that's been happening in your bloodline, things, you know, behaviors and things. Because just because you're saved doesn't mean that you automatically stop everything you're doing. So I, I don't want to get too far into that, but I just want to kind of briefly skim that point. That there's still some salvation work that needs to be done. You're saved. Okay, now what about saving your money? 
What about the salvation work in, 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 in your heart? Your soul is saved. But it's your heart saved, you know? Because you're speaking in tongues and you still hate people. You know, are your hands saved? Is there salvation in your feet? Are you still, the, oh my gosh, I'm, I won't go into that, but I just hope I gave you enough. And the Holy Spirit, I trust you to finish that for them, who, whoever needs it. <sighs> Let's finish up this thought. Um, so God said, I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And so the way, the, the qualifier for that is to be merciful. Because to be merciful qualifies you for the mercy of God. And can I say something? This is not limited to saved people. There are many unsaved people. It's a principle. It's not a salvation principle. It's a kingdom principle. All right? This is not a principle of salvation. This is a kingdom principle. This is why you find many people who are liberal philanthropists, who are liberal givers, and, and their businesses are blooming. I mean, they're multi-millionaires, billionaires, because they give. They give, you know, they don't call it tithe. They call it donations, but they give. You know? It's not a principle of salvation. It's a principle of giving. There are many principles of in the kingdom. It's not just I'm saved and I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and I'm fire baptized. I'm on my way to heaven anyhow. There's so much more to life than that. I'm getting out of that. Uh, James chapter 2 verse 13 and I'm closing. Says this. For he shall have judgment without mercy that have showed no mercy and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. All right. And so I, again, I just took this out of context, but I want to show you something. That when you don't show mercy, there is a judgment against mercy. So Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So in other words, you are blessed. Why? Because you are merciful. You operate out of the bowels of your compassion. And you even find a scripture where they, you know, where they shut up their bowels of compassion. They wouldn't help turn the people away. I think that was, in, what's that? I, I'm not even going to try to figure that out right now because I'm, I'm going to go down another rabbit trail. But there was an instance in scripture where the people shut up their bowels of compassion. All right. But God is saying, I want your bowels of compassion to be open. I want yours to be open. I want people, I want to be able to send people to you if they need help. And I want you to be able to honor that request or whatever that looks like. You know, according to your ability, of course, according to what you're able to do, humanly able to do. Um, but I don't want you to shut your bowels of compassion. So I'm going to bless you if you do this, if you hear something negative about someone, excuse me, instead of you taking it and running with it, operating in the Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 um, mentality, excuse me, I want you to take that thing to God, um, to, to me and pray. I want you to pray about it. And if you're in position to help, that's what I expect you to do. That's what qualifies you for the blessing of mercy. Because believe it or not, as long as you live on the earth, you're going to have tribulation. The godly will suffer persecution. Things are going to happen to you. And guess what? The same mercy that you denied somebody will be denied to you too. For God is not mocked. Whatever a man sow, that will he reap. James 2.13 says, For judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. What does that mean? That means when you're going through something, the judgment on your life for mercy is that you don't get it. It's that you don't get it. And I'm telling you, there are people right now who need the mercy of God. They need God to open doors. They need God to speak to the hearts of supervisors. They need God to speak to the hearts of, of, of judges and, and, and police officers. When they, you need, We need the mercy of God. So that when we say, like my grandfather prayed, Lord, have mercy. God said, yes, I will have mercy. Yes, I will show you favoritism. Yes, I will show up and stand and defend you. Yes, I will. I will send human agents. I will send human angels to 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 to, to bless you, to help rescue you out of a sin. Yes, I will be merciful. But the judgment, according to James 2.13, for those of you who don't show mercy, your judgment is you don't get it. And there are some people who love God. I know they love God. But because they not, have not sown mercy, they didn't know. First, some people don't even know. Wow, I didn't even know. I'm some of you saying right now, I didn't know. I had no idea that that's what God expected of me. I didn't know. And then you, Holy Spirit is going to bring situations back to your mind where you, that was a, a test, a mercy test for you. And, that, you know, what does that look like? What does that look like? You know? And so if you didn't do well, say, so you know what, God, with this understanding, the woman of God took her time to, to, to share this message. And God, it's resonating in my spirit. I feel that you're talking to me. And God, I have not done well 
before in these scenarios i I shut up the house of my compassion i was like the man in luke 11 i would not do it because i didn't want to but now god i have understanding right the word of god is a light unto my feet and a lamp to my path a a lamp to my feet a light to my path and so now i have i have understanding and god forgive me for every time that i have withheld mercy forgive me for every area in my life where, where i've shut up god i feel the presence of god jesus father i thank you I thank you for your presence on the line today Um, or in this message. Thank you, God. Um, You know, Father, forgive me for the times that I I, I knew. I knew I heard you say do it. And I just did. I disobeyed you, God, with my eyes wide open. And I found myself in a situation, God, and I didn't see you. The Bible said, blessed are pure in heart, for they shall see God. God, I didn't see you. Or it's taken a long, you're way too far away from me, God. I can't see you. But Father, today I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to, to, Lord God, give me another opportunity, Lord. Let me show to you that I've learned this lesson. Let me, allow me, God, grace me again to show you, God, that I got it. I know I, I will show myself merciful because I need mercy. My children need mercy. My grandchildren need mercy. Those in my realm of influence need mercy. And so God, I, like, like, you know, like the example with the woman of God with her daughter, let me teach what mercy looks like. The art of mercy. Because it's not intrinsic within me. It, it wasn't born in me. It's something I have to learn. So grant me another opportunity to show mercy, God. So that I can obtain mercy. So people of God, I pray that this message has blessed you. I know it has blessed me. I've been, listen, <laughs> I have been feeling the presence of God so strong in this word. I, I, I don't know what God is about to do. Um, but I just feel God. I feel God. So I just, I, I just pray that we've said something to encourage your heart, something to make you think, something to inspire you to go and dig in scripture and search for yourself. Be like the Bereans. Let me see if what she's saying is right. <laughs> go study. Go study. Amen. And let the Holy Spirit take you deeper than, than what I could in these little few minutes. Um, let the Holy Spirit take you down in that word and show you what he's saying so, he can, so you can live a blessed life, a fruitful, productive life. Um, so you can deal with those seeds. Some of us have some real, real bad seed. Um, the Holy Spirit is saying, go and dig that up. Go and dig that up. Amen. Burn it. Amen. Uh, So we love you. We uh, appreciate your time and pray that what we said has been a blessing to you. Until next time, grace and peace.